songs about our victory in Christ this morning and just celebrating his, his power and his providence and his perfect love. So let's just open up in prayer and um, just enjoy a, a victorious time of worship. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for the victory you won. We cannot devote our lives too much to you. Lord, I just pray that that our love and our pursuit of you is, is radical, is, is desperate, is honest and humble. I just pray that all of us this morning are able to just further deepen our love for you and, and our, our passion to, to live our lives as you call us to live them. Lord, in this time of worship, I just pray that, that our voices rise in, in humility and in spirit and in truth, that we just celebrate you this morning. We pray all this in your mighty name, King Jesus. Amen.
As we lead into the next song, Holy Spirit, I'd just like to open up the communion tables up front. Um, at your own time, just through this next song, uh, we just welcome you to, to come to the communion table and, and take the elements that just remind us of, of the sacrifice of Jesus. And let's just pray over them really quick. Heavenly Father, this time of communion is, is our opportunity to, to come face to face with you, with your sacrifice on the, on the forefront of our minds. As we take the wafer that represents your body broken for us, both individually and, and corporately, just let us remember just the profound humility that you've you faced on that cross. And Lord, as we take the juice that represents the blood poured out for us, we just thank you for the blood that covers us, that covers our sin and our shame and wipes us clean. Lord, you, you make us white as snow. And Lord, I just pray that during this time of communion that we just surrender ourselves to you in repentance. We love you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Your glory, God is. 
Yes, Lord, that is our prayer. That we become increasingly more aware of your presence. That you, Jesus, that you alone have our affection, devotion, and the adoration of our heart that we seek your face, that we long to be tethered by your side and in step with your spirit. We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for making this both our prayer and a reality we get to grow in day by day with you, all because of grace, all because of what you've done for us, Jesus. We pray this. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, y'all can have a a seat. Um, Wow, so many of you guys beat me to it. What's up, guys? Hey, we have a really special uh, element uh, in our gathering here this morning, and it's a baby dedication. And uh, just so beautiful. Yeah, come on. And um, just a wild guess but I think more dedications will probably come down the pipe here soon. (laughs) Like everywhere you look, you just see a mom like just doing the dance and thank you, Jesus, just for new life and for blessing and the miracle uh, of of parenthood and our precious little kids. What's up, sweetie? Um, I, I, I always find it to be appropriate to speak really briefly into what dedication is all about. Uh, a, A baby dedication comes from the parents, and the parents, really it's a threefold dedication that includes a recognition, a declaration, and an invitation. And so first, parents recognize that before they held their children in their hands, their children were held and fashioned and formed by the hands of God. And Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Parents recognize that before these children ever belonged to us, they were first and foremost given to us as a gift by God himself. Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord. 
They are a reward from him. So despite certain narratives, children are not an accident. They're not a mistake. They are precious. They are gifts to us from God. Secondly, dedication is about a parent's declaration uh, that children are a gift given to us from God, but they are also a gift that we dedicate back to God. I think of Hannah. Hannah in the Old Testament, she struggled with infertility and was even mocked for it at one point, but God mercifully and miraculously allowed Hannah to become pregnant. And when the boy was weaned, she dedicated him back to God saying, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And in the same vein, we see child dedication as a public declaration of the parent's desire to give back to God what he has given to them. Lastly, dedication is the parent's invitation to the church family. Uh, Parents express before you their desire to raise their children to know the words and the ways of God. But parents also express before you that they can't do it on their own. They need the church. They need their community of faith, a community that is built around Jesus to come come alongside them and to love their children with Christ-like love. It's hard at times to ask for help because so many of us, we struggle with this thing called pride and our society reinforces a very individualistic do-it-your-own type of mentality. But we, as people of faith, we are humbled by God's grace to know that we need a kingdom and we need the family to help us point our kids to Jesus. So in dedicating a baby, parents are giving their kingdom community, their church family, the family of God, invitation, a welcome to love and help and counsel and support them and their child or children. So that being said, Trey and Sarah and Archimedes, let's make your way up on the stage. And we do have a handheld mic somewhere right there. Awesome. Let's go. Okay. So the mic is yours. And if there's just a word of blessing, uh, a passage, or just any other invitation you want to invite your church family into uh, with the birth of your precious son, feel free to go for it. Okay, um, it took me a while to pick a passage for him because there's so many um, good ones here. I ended up on 2 Timothy um, chapter 1, verses 7 through 14. I'm so glad he's awake. Okay. <laughs> for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, 
and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as a partner of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I came up here to speak, there was about half this many people, and so I'm twice as nervous. Is that how that works? Is that good math? Uh, this scripture to me uh, always is special to my heart personally, but uh, if you've read the Bible and are familiar, you know that this scripture is talking about the Jewish people, God's people, but Later on, through Jesus, we are grafted into that family. So I feel like it applies to us as well. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Amen. <clears throat> <laughs> and there's no greater blessing spoken over your child than the blessing of Scripture to stand on God's truths, to stand on his precious promises, and to speak uh, the scriptural blessing over your son. Um, Archie is an answer to prayer. Many, many prayers. God has been so good to you both. And as a family, it's just an honor to be welcomed into this celebration and to sing the fruition of prayer. God is faithful. And I believe that we have some family here present. So family, um, if you want to make your way up, I see some family in the back. If you want to make your way up to lay a hand on uh, this father and mother and this precious little baby boy, you can feel free to come on up. And then church family, if you just want to stay where you're at, but extend a hand in prayer to Trey and Sarah as well, that would be amazing. I think he's saying, wrap this up, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> so, Lord, you, you heard this threefold prayer from Trey and Sarah this morning, that this is both a recognition that Archimedes is a gift that comes from you, uh, precious to your heart. We thank you for this gift. We also um, know that they have made a declaration to raise their child up to know the way of Jesus. And they have invited, uh, just by being up here this morning, uh, the church family to surround them uh, with this desire to point Archie to the way of Jesus. We love you. God, we are so thankful for your faithfulness. And in the many times that we trip and stumble along the way. Your grace upholds us. Your grace meets us, sustains us, and strengthens us to continue to parent and to disciple well. So we dedicate, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Archimedes, back to you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And the church says, amen. 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 Awesome. Let's go. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, and with that, uh, if you're in preschool or in elementary kiddos, it's time to be dismissed to go to Kids Town. Uh, we have leaders uh, in the back and in the lobby with signs uh, for what classroom to go to as you follow them. Hey, and as the little kids move to their classroom, big kids, adults in the room, let's move around for a few minutes.
Let's move even across the room. I know it's crazy, but let's greet one another uh, in the name of the Lord for a few minutes this morning. Good morning. Okay, wait a sec. No, you gotta leave it on. I say, return to your seats. Please. Ready? Go ahead. Return to your seats, please. Return to your seat, please. <laughs> Hold on, you there. Give them a moment. They're still chatting.
Are you ready? Rise for the reading of scripture. All right. This is from Psalms 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. This is the Lord of the Lord. Come on. <laughs> wow, you all can have a seat. That was absolutely amazing. Oh, man, I love it. Hey, last week we started our fall series titled Rhythms of Grace. And in this series, our goal as a church is to identify, understand, and implement the nine core practices and relational rhythms that collectively shaped the lifestyle of Jesus, otherwise known as the way of Jesus. And not only did these core practices collectively shape what is known as the way of Jesus, but they marked the followers of Jesus so much so that in the first century, Christians weren't really known as Christians within the community. They were known as followers of the way. Those who belonged to the way. It was the way that they lived their life. It was the way that they structured their life. It was the way that they imitated the spiritual practices of their rabbi that set them apart from the culture around them. Now, if you missed last week's teaching and really even the teaching before that, I strongly encourage you to either go to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or our website and get caught up because in those teachings, we have set the stage for this series. Uh, Last week, we covered a rhythm of grace known as community. Community is a primary way to practice being with Jesus because Jesus can be found in the company of his family. And not only that, community is a primary way to be formed into the image of Jesus, to become like Jesus, because through the practice of community, we are invited by the Spirit to supernaturally, selflessly, and sacrificially love and serve imperfect people, much like how Jesus loves and serves you and me. I've actually heard it before as I'm just inviting the school district over to attend this gathering. They said, oh, Laurel Church? I was like, yeah, yeah, pastor at Laurel Church, you want to come? And they said, no, thank you. I know a few people that go to your church. So I say that twofold. One, be careful how you live and what you post. Be a witness. Secondly, it's for their good if they come here because iron sharpens iron. We should not all enjoy each other 100% of the time. It would be too comfortable here. We wouldn't grow. It is good to be in community for our sanctification, for our growth, not necessarily for our comfort. If it was for comfort's sake, this would be a clique, not a community. So, today's practice is the other side of the coin, though. A complementary rhythm to that of community. It's the practice of solitude. And along with solitude, I would just add solitude's companion, silence. But before we explore solitude, let's jump back to the year 2007, a year that significantly accelerated global digitalization. It was the year that Steve Jobs and Apple Tech released the first iPhone, the year when a relatively unknown microblogging site called Twitter became its own platform and went global. And it was the year when Facebook became available, not just to college students, on campus, but to anyone and everyone who had an email address. And since 2007, digital progress and technological advancement has boomed. And there are both pros and cons to this. Here's a pro. Google Maps. (laughs) Like, this, this dates me. 
to be incredibly young when I say I can't even imagine driving in a city like Seattle or some large city without Google Maps telling me exactly where I need to go. And if I take a wrong turn, it reroutes me exactly to where I need to go next to get to the destination. I'm so thankful for that app. Here's the con. There are also thousands of other apps that have been created with the sole purpose of brainwashing us into digital oblivion. Here's another pro. We have social media platforms like Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram that connects us to so many people. Here's a pro, I mean, here's a con to that pro. Social media has also been a platform used by keyboard warriors to spread division, slander, confusion, and hatred. Here's a pro. Because of technology, the good news of Jesus has never been so accessible worldwide as it is today. Here's a con. Because of technology, porn has never been so accessible worldwide as it is today. The top three porn sites alone receive a combined 5.8 billion website visits per month. Pro. Our work has become increasingly more efficient and productive because of our online applications and systems. Con, so many of us now take work with us into our homes because of our phones, which means we've become a people that do not know how to clock in and clock out. Because of that, we are anxious, restless, and so many of us are overworked. We don't know how to disconnect. Here's a pro. People today know more information than ever before in the history of human civilization. Here's the con. We're exhausted. Because we don't actually have the mental, emotional, and spiritual bandwidth to absorb all of this information. Now, here's my point. The boom of technology has greatly accelerated the pace of our society. And as a result, so many of us today are over-informed, overstimulated, overwhelmed, overworked, and far too easily distracted. In short, we've become a busy people, a hurried people, hurried to get to the next moment, even if that means skipping past the moment right in front of you. Hurry to get to the next task, even though the task at hand isn't really complete, because we just need to multitask, we, stand, we can't focus. Hurry to reach for your phone and see if there's a new notification. Would you and I know no one hits you up? There is no notification to check. Hurry to get the next project done, the next item purchased, the next trip booked, the next weekend to enjoy, the next bottle of wine to be poured, the next, the next, the next. Y'all, even psychologists who don't know Jesus know that something's wrong. In their attempt to put language to the damaging effects of hurry, they've come up with the term, quote unquote, hurry sickness, which they define as a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. How many of you are a little bit sick this morning? Now, what are the symptoms of hurry sickness? Hypersensitivity, irritability, restlessness, compulsive overworking, emotional numbness, you just can't feel anything anymore, escapist behaviors, what's the next thing that can drown me out from fill in the blank, lack of care for your body, isolation. And a couple of spiritual directors passionate about discipleship to Jesus have also added the symptom of slipping in your spiritual practices. How are we doing this morning? Upon being asked what to do to be spiritually healthy in the days we're living in, the late Christian philosopher Dallas Willard slowly replied, saying, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Before Dallas Willard, Corey Ten Boom used to say, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. 
And before Corey Ten Boom, it was Mark Twain who said, our busyness is like the weather. Everyone complains about it, but no one does anything about it. But what if there was something that we could do about it? What if there was a practice we could commit to as a church that would help us resist the rush and help silence the noise of this restless and rebellious world while anchoring our souls in the quiet, restorative peace and presence of the God Most High? There is. It's the practice of solitude. And I feel that God may be inviting us into this practice the way he invited King David into this type of practice long before us. Be still, God said to David. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Stop striving and be still. Now, if I were to define the spiritual practice of solitude, it would go something like this. To be quietly alone with and waiting on God. To be quietly alone with and waiting on God. God, and there is a beautiful passage that describes how we grow and are formed by God who meets us in the place of solitude with him. Psalm 131, it's the text that was just read to us moments ago. It says, my heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Now, in its original context, Psalm 131 was a prayer from David regarding Israel. But in Christ, This prayer can also be personalized by you and me and all of Jesus' disciples. And if we read this psalm in that way, that means you and I and all God's people are likened to a small child with their mother. Now, any mother can tell you that for an infant, every need is a crisis, right? Right? Like, it, it, it's, it's amazing how my wife, she'll grab little Grayson and come up to the couch where the nursing pillow's at and just temporarily lay Grayson down on the couch just to put the pillow around her and pick him up like three seconds later. And in the three seconds, he's like, no! Where are you? You know, like, in three seconds. She's like, little child, I'm not going to abandon you, like... For an infant, every need is a crisis. When an infant feels hungry, they don't ask their mom for a snack. They cry, they kick, they scream. A hungry infant jumps immediately into crisis mode, demanding milk and demanding it now. And once their need is met, once they are fed and feel satisfied... And a milk coma starts to just settle in. Peace comes to rest on that precious little baby for an hour. (laughs) Maybe less. Until the need comes back, and then it's a whole nother crisis all over again. For an infant, every need is a crisis, which makes peace for an infant the temporary satisfaction of my most immediate and urgently felt need. And that's the stage of the the spiritual life that most of us start at in our apprenticeship to Jesus, is it not? But sadly, it's the stage of the spiritual life that most of us never actually mature beyond. 
with every new need we have, we feel as though it's a crisis, which means we tend to associate peace as the temporary satisfaction of the most immediate and urgently felt need. And this explains why so many of us, even though we love Jesus, and some of us, we even have a good track record and a good attendance sheet when it comes to going to church, we still impulsively seek to distract ourselves with toys or with the company of others. Or we numb ourselves with another drink in the fridge. We love Jesus, but we preoccupy ourselves by dreaming of the weekend or another vacation. We, we love Jesus, but we go ahead and be, because of this crisis, because of this need, then we please ourselves by going back to porn or whatever sin of cho choice you use to cope with. Or how many of us, we just throw ourselves into our work when there's a crisis. Because if we feel distracted enough, numb enough, pleased enough, or productive enough, then we might, just maybe, maybe we might come to experience temporary peace from the pain we feel and the need we have. But my friends, this means that peace has become circumstantial. Which also means that like an infant, we will kick, cry, and scream every time a pain arises or a need is felt that disrupts that circumstantial peace. But a weaned child is a baby that has grown accustomed to food other than their mother's milk. A weaned child still gets hungry, but has learned to trust their mother as provider rather than demand that the need be met immediately. In other words, the weaned child has learned to find peace by their mother's presence, not her mother's milk. But again, as any mother would tell you, and as a helpless bystander named dad, whether it's weaning or the process of sleep training, it's really difficult for most because a baby is weaned by being denied the thing they want immediately when they want it and from the very person they're supposed to trust. But it is through the process of weaning that the baby learns to wait and to trust because a good mother will satisfy their need, but at the proper time not by the infant's timetable. And a good mother will give their baby what they need, which is solid food, not what they think they want, which is milk. Church, Psalm 131 is a picture of a baby believer who has matured into a weaned child. A believer who has grown to trust in the sufficiency of God's presence, not just in the acts of God's power whose peace has come by knowing God as provider, desiring God for himself, not just as a means for his provision so we get what we want when we want it. Which means, like a small child, you and I must be weaned. We must go through the process of being temporarily denied the very things we think we want when we think we want them by the very one whom we're supposed to trust. What I'm trying to say is that growing up in the way of Jesus involves a little spiritual kicking, crying, and screaming because it involves weaning, learning how to trust by waiting. Tyler Satan, a pastor in Portland whom I deeply admire, defines waiting as, quote, the courageous insistence on living with my deep desire and felt need held out before God for a long time, a whole lot longer than I'd like, allowing God to wean my soul from dependence on his provision to the true rest of knowing God as my provider. Are you guys picking up what I'm putting down? In her book, When the Heart Waits, author Sue Monk Kidd describes the time when her inner world was chaos, when she was anxious, 
restless, unable to find peace, and honestly in the midst of a spiritual crisis. But she has such a drive to find peace, she actually planned a short stay at a monastery. And on one particular morning at the monastery, as her impulsivity once again got the best of her, and she just needed to be moving, she couldn't sit still, she got up and went on a walk. And on her walk, she saw a monk sitting perfectly still beneath a tree. Later, she sought him out and said to him, I saw you sitting beneath the tree. Like, just sitting there so still. How is it that you can wait so patiently in that moment? I I just can't seem to get used to the idea of doing nothing. And the monk began to smile. Well, there's the problem right there, young lady. You've bought into the cultural myth that when you're waiting, you're doing nothing. Kid writes, then he took his hands and placed them on my shoulders, peered straight into my eyes and said, I hope that you'll hear what I'm about to tell you. I hope you'll hear it all the way down to your toes. When you're waiting, you're not doing nothing. You're doing the most important something there is. You're allowing your soul to grow up. If you can't be still and wait, you can't become what God created you to be. Maybe, just maybe, this is why we find this instruction to wait on God 116 times throughout Scripture. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Micah 7, 7, but as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior, my God will hear me. Again, this is why my working definition of solitude is, quote, to be quietly alone with and waiting on God. But what does this look like practically in our day-to-day lives? I'll just say this for this morning. It looks like carving out a time and dedicating this space. Okay, so first, carve out a time. Like, actually... Okay, practice. How many of you guys schedule your day and your week on your phone through your app, through your calendar app? Anybody? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. For, for those of you who do that, uh, take your cell phone out. Okay? Don't say, you don't bring it to church. Don't lie to me. It's here. I hear ESPN notifications going off left and right. My fantasy football team. I'll wrap it up. I get the point. Take out your phone. Okay? And open up the calendar app. Okay, if if this is you, if this is already a practice that you schedule your life through this particular app, this is for you. Take out your phone, open up the calendar app, and for this next week, actually schedule a routine time to meet with God. Like actually prioritize and organize your calendar around your time of solitude with the Lord. Like, go ahead and fill your schedule with work and responsibilities and meetings and commitments and family and dinner and plans and community group and church. Like, fill your schedule, but do so after you first schedule your routine solitude time with the Lord. Now, I'm a spontaneous guy. Like, I, 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 I love just chasing butterflies. I love talking and in mid-conversation, squirrel. It, it's who I am. I've always been like this, right? I, I keep our staff guessing 
a lot. Hey, so you said three months ago that the routine for this Sunday is this. Let's change it. You know, like, like this is, I'm a spontaneous guy. And I used to think that structure would kill relationship. A structure would kill intimacy. I've now been married a little over 10 years. My wife and I have four kids. And I now know that structure does not kill intimacy. It encourages intimacy and protects intimacy. And neither do I view structure like a planned date night as the only context in which I pour into my wife and emotionally invest into her. A date night does not reduce our relationship to just that particular time, nor does it squash the spontaneity of our love for each other. It actually protects it. And the same is with our relationship with God. If the only time we acknowledge God is in our solitude with him, 10 minutes a day, then we have reduced our entire relationship with God most high into a 10-minute routine. But at the same time, that 10-minute routine, 10 minutes of just silence and stillness and solitude with God, that doesn't kill spontaneously walking and keeping in step with the Spirit. It actually protects intimacy with God and helps cultivate a listening ear to the spontaneous impulses of the Spirit. Amen. So carve out time and dedicate a space. Jesus actually modeled dedicating a space for us. In Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In Greek, the word solitary is eremos. Eremos can mean lonely place, solitary place, or wilderness. How often in the Gospels do you read that Jesus went to one of those descriptions? All the time. Jesus had a place he would go to, a space that was sacred for him. He would go to the Eremos for his time of solitude with the Father. Luke 5, 15 through 16, yet the good news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Like, whoa, ministry is booming. Look at all the success. Look at all the needs, the demands. Jesus, whoa. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, to the Eremos, and prayed. And in Mark 6, after sending his apprentices to do the types of things he had been doing, his apprentices came back to him, and we read this in Mark 6. They gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. How many of you, like, reading that just kind of, like, de defined your week this past week? Did you guys have a week like that? What did Jesus say? You can sleep when you're dead. No. They had a busy, stinking week. What did he say? He said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Let's go to my favorite place called the Edomos. And let's get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. In the life of Jesus, we constantly see Jesus retreating from people to spend alone time with his father and then returning to the people in the power of the spirit and in the love of his father. Amen. We see the practices of both community and solitude. And the solitude feels your capacity to love your community. This is what makes solitude different than isolation. Isolation is disconnection from your community. Solitude is to be filled with the life and love of the Father so you can pour that back into your community. So carve out a time. Dedicate a space. Y'all, what's your space? What's your consecrated, I'm going to meet with the Lord kind of space? Is it sitting on the floor in your bedroom or on a chair? Is it in your living room? Your office, 
To be honest, one of my meeting places is in the shower. I just have the best God thoughts in the shower. Honestly, for some of you, it is the car. And if the car, you're, like, you're literally unpacking your life, you're like, I don't really have that spot. I don't have the time. But, I, but you do drive from point A to point B. Turn off the podcasts. Turn off the radio. Make your car your Edermos, your solitary place of meeting with the Lord. And if your place of meeting with the Lord has become so familiar, right? Familiarity breeds contempt. If it becomes so familiar that you lose an intentionality that like, oh yeah, I'm actually meeting with God, not checking my fantasy football, not checking Instagram, not checking about what I'm, you know, got penciled in for the rest of the day. If that space has become so familiar, then do some things in that space to draw your senses back to intentional meeting with God. What I mean by that is like for me, upstairs in my office, I have a prayer corner. I have paintings, I have a prayer rope I hold on to, I have a candle that I light. And through visual, through touch, through sight and smell, I am engaging my senses back to a place of intentional meeting with God. Because I am a butterfly chasing, squirrel looking type of individual. I get distracted. And so if that's you, and you're having a hard time focusing in that familiar Jesus space, light a candle. Do you know that that's actually an ancient Christian practice? That when a candle is lit, that symbolically speaks, speaks to the fact that you are in the presence of God and you're meeting with the Holy Spirit. Carve out a time, dedicate a space, and I would just add this one thing. Be still. And what I mean by that is be silent. <laughs> God is the author of joy, and we are going to have a blast in the new heaven and new earth with him. I'm just saying. Thank you, Jesus. That was actually hilarious. <laughs> Mother Teresa... She once said, we all must take the time to be silent and to contemplate. She says, I always begin my prayer in silence. For it is in the silence of the heart that God speaks. God is the friend of silence. We need to listen to God because it's not what we say, but what he says to us and through us that matters. In the late 4th century, when men and women fled the cities to live in the desert in order to have deeper communion with God, what we call in that era of Christian history the desert fathers and desert mothers, during that era, a man went to an elder of the desert community. This man then asked the elder and desert father for some advice, and the elder said to him, go. Sit in your cell, which means your prayer closet, and your cell, your prayer closet, will, te will teach you everything. Meaning, don't run to me first. Go to God first and be quiet before him. See what he shows you. I feel like for many of us, we run to community to get easy answers because we want to bypass solitude. I can't fix you. The person sitting next to you that you love can't fix you. We can only point you to Jesus. Meet with him. Go to him. Before you run to community, which should confirm the word of the Lord, Go to God first, and he is faithful to speak the word of the Lord to you. Solitude will help you become familiar to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it is through silence that you will become familiar to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Guys, think about the person you're in deepest relationship with. 
right, a friend, a spouse. What would happen if all you did in that relationship was all the talking? You just talked. Blah, 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 and you never listened. Would that be a deep relationship? Would that be a relationship that is thriving and healthy? No. And yet so often in our prayer life, we talk to God or we talk at God. We word vomit on God. How many of us are quiet enough where we actually press in to listen to God? The Spirit doesn't yell at us. He whispers because he's close. I think like Elijah, we want God to yell and make himself known in the wind or an earthquake or a fire. But like Elijah, God will often speak to us in a gentle whisper. Worship team coming up, I just want to close with a brief little story. Brother Lawrence of the 17th century was an absolute nobody in society. His short military career came to an end because of an injury. and Because of his PTSD, he couldn't keep a job as a footman. So he joined a community of monks, became the monastery dishwasher, and devoted the rest of his life learning how to continuously commune with God, how to be aware of and abide in God's presence, how to be with Jesus, as we like to say here, all day long. And y'all, Brother Lawrence became so sensitive to the Holy Spirit, so tethered to the life of God, so at home in the Father's love, so full of heaven's peace that people from all over that area heard of his story and would write to him, not the monks, to him, the monastery dishwasher, asking him for spiritual guidance. And among many things that Brother Lawrence said and wrote back to give guidance to others, this particular quote of his has been preserved in Christian history. He said, the time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, Hey, yo, parenthood. I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees before the blessed sacrament, meaning I have just as much peace in the kitchen during rush hour than I do on my knees taking communion with God. You see, in the life of Brother Lawrence, there came a day in his maturity where there was genuinely no difference between a time of quiet prayer and the noise and clatter and chaos of the kitchen. There's no difference between taking communion and being clocked in during work at a rush hour. He discovered how to live in the tangible peace and presence of God something that he coined and then gave for future centuries called practicing the presence of God. Have you guys ever heard that term? Came from this dude. Now I tell you this story because this is what the small 10-minute practice of solitude and silence is all about. It's not just mastering that practice. If you seek to master the practice of solitude, you're missing greatly the point. Here's the goal of a little quiet time with God. As you intentionally practice stillness before God, God will form you through this practice to have a soul that is still, even in the midst of the chaos of our culture. By intentionally quieting ourselves before God each day, our soul matures into a soul of quiet tranquility, even in the midst of the volume of the world's noises. Through the daily and willing and voluntary practice of waiting on the Lord, 
Our soul is weaned off of circumstantial peace and is grown up to find peace, not in what God can do for us, but in who God is to us. As you become familiar to the presence of God through a designated time of solitude, you'll become a person so familiar to the presence of God all throughout your day. In the culture of anxiety, hurry, and noise, my prayer and desire is to see Laurel Church increasingly become a community of peace, and quiet through the practice of solitude. Could it be that God is inviting you into the practice of solitude the same way he invited King David into the very same practice long ago? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What we're, what we're going to start doing in our Sunday morning gatherings is just create a pocket of stillness and silence at some point in our gathering because for so many of you, that's the only peace and quiet you have all week. I don't want this place just to be a place of noise. There is a time to shout and to yell and to praise. God is so good. And there's a time to be just still before him. And I want to honor that as well. Because without margin, without time to be still before the Lord, we cannot be a deep people. Depth takes time. It takes margin. It takes reflection. It takes commitment. So let's enter into just a small bit of silence as a church and just be with Jesus individually and communally. Let him love. And uh, I'm excited to sing this song with you guys. Um, we've done a thing in the past where after the Easter service, you know, for the next couple of months, we make an emphasis that we get to live in the post-resurrection story. We know, the, we know the end. We know the sacrifice that Jesus made and the victory that he won. Um, and so we like to, as a worship team once in a while, do songs like this as just a booster shot to remind us that Easter is our everyday life and that that peace and that 
that confidence we have in Christ is because we get to, we get the luxury of being alive in a time where we know the whole story. And uh, so if we just want to stand and just celebrate the entire story of Christ and uh, just celebrate him. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon God was laid in darkness. 
risen oh I think we could do better I know we're six months from six months too but he is risen there we go that's better okay if you are new to Laurel we welcome you thank you for joining us this morning please be sure to pick up a welcome packet on your way out at the welcome booth so as always there's three ways to stay connected we've got the response cards this is an interactive uh session guys so let's try that again we got okay and we got flyers that you guys can also pick up on the way out and then there's the weekly email if you are not getting the weekly email please fill out the response card to get your email uh to us so that we can send out the weekly email um youth group is back at it and we have yeah we got youth okay whoop, whoop, okay and um we need meals for these kiddos. We get the privilege to sit down and have a meal with these kids. And sometimes this is the only family style meal they get in a week or a month or a year or whatever. And so it's very important to us to be able to do that. If you are interested, please look at the, uh, go to the welcome or the weekly email and uh, get the signupgenius.com link to go do so. Um, also, on the 12th, we have volunteer workshop. So if you are a volunteer or you're interested in becoming a volunteer, please join us for that on the 12th at 9 o'clock. Um, and then we have two things going on right after the service. We have Dove Notes, but we also have our membership voting time. Um, uh, and this is to vote for our potential new care pastor, Carl Johnson. Um, so if you could just give us a few minutes right after the service, you'll come up here, check in, um, and get your ballot that way, and then just put it right in the box after you're done. Um, so that is right after I'm done talking. But let's close in prayer first. <sighs> Lord Jesus, I thank you for just allowing us to come to you with everything that we carry knowing that you want to take it from us and carry it for us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that in our busy lives, we will just take a moment or more, Lord, just to stand in your presence, Lord, and to have solitude with you, Lord. I pray that you'll just put that heavy on our hearts, that we will really focus on creating that rhythm with you. Go before us, Lord. I pray that you help us to shine bright for you. And we pray this all in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week.